talk after you have something like that. Well, good morning. How are you all doing? Good. Everybody doing fine? Everybody have a good weekend? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Some of you have no idea who I am, and that's okay. <laughs>
this town is home. And I know a lot of people in this town that even know Jesus Christ. And it's only going to be because of a lighthouse that sits on the corner of 3rd Street that's going to make it happen. Because whether you all really know it or not, you're, you're the only evangelical show in town. And I say show tongue-in-cheek. You're the only evangelical church in town that are going to tell people what must happen for them to, to, to inherit eternal life. That's your all's responsibility. And I just feel really responsible to help you all through a time in the, future, in the history of this church that really stinks. And I hate it. But that's God's call. He didn't wake up the day that Nathan passed away and was surprised when it happened. He knew it was going to happen. And he knew every one of you were going to be here today. He, Leslie has to remind me on a regular basis, he's got this. He's got it. Her, her statement to me about a lot of times is, why are you worried about stuff that God's already got? He's already got it. You don't have to worry about it. He knows what's going to happen. Well, there's a lot of 100% truth to that. You know, in Rick Warren's book, 40 Days of Purpose, in his first day um, uh, of that study, there's, some, there's a few little words in there that knocks the ball out of the park. And those few little words is, it's not about you, but it's all about him. And if, if he has that thought in mind, don't you think he's got this? I, I want to tell you today, God already knows who your next pastor is. And I will tell you something else that's not Dwayne Carter. I'm not here candidating to be your next pastor. I, I can just assure you of that. It would, uh, not that I don't love you, but you know when you finally live in a town where there's fast food and, and a mall and a steakhouse and... I'm just joking. I'm not just joking. Um, there is a lot that's going to happen in the church over the next year and a half, two years, three years. So... Um, I guess what I'm asking this morning is just have an open heart. Have an open heart, have a willing spirit, and be moldable. Be moldable. I know I've heard last week, I talked with Mike this past week, he, he talked about change, and I know that's already scared a lot of you to death because that is a four-letter word in the Baptist church. But it's okay. I remember when the carpet you pulled up this week was put down. <laughs> I voted to, to do the color and, and the little maroon stripe or green stripe that was around here. I, that was all that was like contemporary back then. <laughs> and it's gone today. And that's changed. And the vast majority of you don't drive the same car that you drove ten years ago. The mass, some of you might, but the vast majority of you don't. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm just here to, to, to help encourage you guys as we move forward. I, I want to direct your attention today to Romans chapter 5. And, and all the while that I'll be preaching here, I'll be using the ESV uh, Bible. And uh, it's going to be up on the screen and, and that kind of stuff. One of the things Paul did in, in his ministry was he was encouraged. Sometimes he had to beat people over the head to encourage them. But Paul was a great encourager. And Paul was a man of faith. You know, we could go all the way back into Acts chapter 9 when Paul got saved, and he was a bad dude. And it wasn't until after salvation, after some education, after some instruction, after lots of people prayed for him, after God got a hold of him and really shook him up good, that Paul understood what it meant to have faith. And a lot of times in our lives, as, as mature Christians, we forget the idea of faith. Having to have faith because we can do it. And you all, as, as a church, you can have the, the attitude, we can do this, yes we can. 
But that's not the attitude that you need to have. The attitude you need to have is through Christ in faith, He will lead us and guide us to do the things that we need to do as a congregation. Yes, you do need to do some things as a congregation. And that's okay. It's okay. But it's got to be done in faith, in Christ, in order for everything to go out just fine. I said in a, in a meeting with your deacons a few weeks ago, great godly men, and, and every one of them there, believe that in faith, Christ, will guide you down the path that you need to be guided down. In Romans chapter 1, and we'll get to this up here in a minute, everything right now is just free, okay? Um, that's supposed to be funny. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power for salvation to everyone, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, and then also the Greek. And most of the time we stop right there. But you've got to look into verse 17. And it says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. It is written, The righteous shall live by faith. And so often in our churches today, the righteous live by common sense. The righteous live by the things we've done in the past. The righteous have lived in, well, we have done it that way. We have done it this way. We can continue to do it that way. And nowhere in Scripture does it say to rely upon yourself. Everywhere in Scripture it says, in faith, in Christ. In faith, in Christ. And we have to, as Christians today, and especially Southern Baptist Christians, we have to get back to the point that we have got to trust in the workings of the Holy Spirit of God in faith. Through Christ to move us and propel us forward into a darkened world that is only getting darker and darker and darker because the church has shut her mouth. Because for so long, pastors wanted to gather people in their congregation and never send them back out. I, I want to tell you this morning, I thought Mike. Uh, when he stood up here and asked for your prayers, had made a misspeak, a, a misword uh, a little bit. He said, I'm going on a missional trip. And I thought, oh, he needs a mission trip. He just got nervous. But then he said what he said. And I want to tell you, he is going on a missional journey. And we as a church need to be on a missional journey. Because if you remember back to what he said, some of you have already forgotten. He said, I'm going to help reunite some foster care children. And it's not a Christian camp. <gasps> some of your thoughts were, why is our youth pastor going somewhere where it's not a Christian thing? Because we have got to invest ourselves in something that's not Christian. So that we can be the salt and the light of the earth. By faith, by faith, we move forward. By faith, we allow God to redirect us. By faith, we uh, are moistened in our heart and allow God's love to penetrate us and to mold us and form us and fashion us for tomorrow, not today. But I want to be honest with you. I love living in today. I really love living in yesterday. I've been at the State Fair for the, most of the last two weeks um, for some silly reason. Have any of you ever lived two weeks at the Missouri State Fair? <laughs> I don't see any hands. I must be the only crazy one in here. I lived in yesterday down there because the same tractor set on the same spot that they set on for a hundred years. <laughs> The same people are running the carnival that ran the carnival 50 years ago. The, the same people are in the same beer joints up and down the street as they were. They're in the same spots. People love to live in yesterday. But as a church, you can't live in yesterday. As a church, you have to, by faith in Christ, live in tomorrow. By faith in Christ, live in next month. By faith in Christ, live in next year. 
I'm not telling you to worry about tomorrow or worry about next month or worry about next year because that would be sinful. But we need to be thinking about what God wants us to do because God is already there. One of my greatest friends in, in the world is a, a man by the name of Reggie McNeil. Reggie McNeil wrote a book several years ago called The Present and Future. And the title of the book was really kind of weird because it said The Present and Future, but when you started reading it, he explained the title. He said, our future is God's presence. God has already been where we currently are. God is always out in front of us. God is always out fresh and new in front of us. And my prayer for me and my family and my ministry is that God will keep me in the shadow of His hand. Because if He keeps me in the shadow of His hand, I'm not too far behind. And I'm never out in front if I'm in the shadow of God's hand. So my prayer for this church is that God will keep you in the shadow of His hand as we walk forward to see what God has to do. Romans chapter 5 says this, verse 1 through 5. I think we'll go there. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into grace. In which, he, in which we stand. We, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our sufferings produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through His Holy Spirit, who He has given us. Who he has given us. Because of Christ in my life, and as I look ac across the congregation, I know a whole lot of you, and because of Christ in your life, we should be looking at things in a different view, in a different, we're, we're looking through a different set of lenses than the lost world looks through uh, at, at what's going on around us. You know, in the last several months, year, well, this town has really been through some stuff. Hard stuff. And, and, and people will go around and they'll go, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened. What's going on here? How come that happened? Why did this happen? And we as Christians, we start playing into that. And we're going, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. That was so horrible. And yada, yada, yada. But we're looking through humanistic lenses. Instead of looking through Christ lenses. And when we look through Christ's lenses, things that happen around us become in a different view. They, come, they become in a clearer picture. Uh, it's kind of like going to the optometrist. Is it better on this one or this one? How many of you just hate those questions? How about this one or this one? Well, they're about the same. Well, is this one brighter or is this one brighter? Through Christ, through Christ, we look through different lenses at every situation that goes on around us. But as humans, we step out of Christ and step back into our life and we look at the things going around us from a humanistic standpoint, a, 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 a worldview that is not a biblical worldview, and we wonder, what in the world is happening around us? We think, our pastor's gone. We know God called him to heaven, but what about us? No, that's not the question. The question is, Hallelujah, Brother Nathan's in heaven, dancing on the golden streets, really getting to eat from a table that's unending, to drink from water that never will thirst again. But we go, oh my gosh, what about us? Oh, poor me. When we should be praying, come quickly, Lord Jesus, I don't want to be there. So what we're going to do in the, in the near future, if you all choose so today, is we're going to start looking through some different lenses. We'll back up, do a little historical view, but then we're going to put it in gear and we're going to go forward. And we're going to look through some different lenses of how to heal, how to get right, how to make things happen. Paul lays this in Romans. And he says, 
He says, therefore, and in that first word, therefore, you know there's something that happened before that. So you have to go back and you have to read the things that happened and how he was talking about faith already to the church at Rome. But you even have to go back further than that because most of us sitting in the pews today think the Bible is written the way we have it in our hands and nothing ever meshes together, nothing ever goes together. But you have to go all the way back to when Paul was in the missionary journey to, to different places and see what he was doing and how God was already forming and how he was fashioning him. So he says, therefore, because I've said all that I said, therefore, I'm going to say something new. Therefore, since we have been justified, listen to what it says in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 um, and, and verse 2, 21 and 22 says this. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Sorry, Rob, not me. <laughs> you were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Christ justified us through his death. Christ justified us through his burial. Christ justified us through his resurrection. And Christ is standing at the right hand of God today, still saying, oh, Dad, don't hurt him. Because so often we are still in the mindset of being alienated and hostile and doing things that are not what God wants us to do. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have worried in the last week about something? To be honest, worry? Is that something God wants us to do? How many of you have thought a bad thought about somebody in the last week? Go ahead, be honest. How many of you have overeaten in the last week? And we don't ever think anything about it. But when we come in the church house, all bets are off because we are not this evil person. And don't you dare, preacher boy, call me evil in mind and in thought. I'm a righteous, saved by grace person. Yes, you are. Yes, I am. But we've got to live our life the way God has pulled us in. And God has justified us through Christ by a five-letter word, faith. Faith. We don't, we don't deserve Christ. It's only by our faith in Him that He has done mighty, massive things for us. By faith. Justification is a legal term. You are justified. So through Christ, legally, we have been justified through His blood. He's made us brand new people. We're new creations. The old is supposed to be gone and the new has come. We're brand new. So as we walk forward in this process, we have to kind of put the old behind and let the new come, but the new can only come with faith. That is the direction that God desires things to go. Through faith. Through faith we have peace. And this is something that's really hard to get to. This peace is really hard to get to. Because we think peace is emotional. But peace is not emotional. Peace is reality. When you allow faith in Christ to work in your life. Peace is not subjective to your feelings. But peace is a sense of reality. If you want to live all bound up in nerves and be a nervous wreck your whole life, and you want to worry about everything that goes on around and you want to do that for your church, then you're not going to have peace. <clears throat> you're not going to have peace. You're going to have confusion. And the way I read the scripture, it says, God is not the author of confusion. But in peace, we have a reality knowing that God is in control. God is at the helm. God has the reins. Whatever analogy you want to put to it, it's all about God and not about and I'm going to tell you that God still wants this church to stand on this corner in this community for a reason. 
And it's probably more of a reason than to beat Casey Bill Baptist tonight in the softball game. Oh, no. Well, I don't know if you all know or not, but they're the King James only people up there. <laughs> you gotta win! <laughs> I'm in high school with Dale Rick, so I can pick on him a little bit. Without it knowing, because he's bigger than me, he could probably hurt me, so. But we have this peace, this overwhelming peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and probably for the most of us, we haven't experienced a whole lot of peace in the last few months. <coughs> because you're dealing with some things that aren't really easy to deal with. You're walking through some things that aren't really easy. And you have the thoughts, what about our church? Where are we going to go from here? What's going to happen? Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? When we have to kind of just sit back and go, okay, God, you lead us. You direct us. <coughs> Give us people to set up, set people up in place of leadership, set people up in places to do the things that need to be done as we walk forward doing what you, God, want us to do. Not what we want to do, but what you want to do through us. See, we are just a vessel. And, and, and if I remember anatomy class right, vessels kind of carry blood from one place to another in the body. And if I remember scripture right, we are part of the body. And as a vessel in the body, we are just the carriers of what God wants to do through us. Through faith in Christ. Through faith in Christ. How can you have that? You have been justified. If you don't know what justification is, if you've never come to the point in your life where you've asked Jesus to forgive you your sins, to make you a brand new person, at the end of the service, Mike's going to be down here, and he wants to pray with you about turning your life over to Christ and about you becoming a vessel of God to this community. In Christ, through Christ. Through Him, verse 2, through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's all I got. That, that's all I have is hope. I have never looked into heaven. I have never seen Jesus visually. And I have never heard the God, voice of God audibly. Some of you maybe have. And I'm going to say it doesn't happen. And say it has never happened to me. But I have hope that when I ask Jesus to forgive my sins and to make me a brand new person, I have hope that there is future for me. And the only thing that, that I can possess is the hope. And the only thing I have to give is the hope of God. I used to tell my dad all the time, he and I used to argue. Now, that's another reason I think Nathan Argent was one of the best pastors in the world. He led my dad to the Lord five weeks before he died. So at that point, you know, it's going to have to be somebody really huge to knock him off that pedestal. But I used to tell my dad all the time we'd argue and, and spat over spiritual things. And, and, and I would say, Dad, if you're right and there's nothing spiritual out there, if you're right and there's nothing spiritual out there, then the only thing I've done for the last 20 some years is try to become a better person. Try to live my life in a better way. And, and if, if, if when I die, I just die and you all bury me and that's, that's the end, okay, I've already made a difference in my life. I've made a difference in my family. We try to do things differently. But, oh, Dad, if I'm right and you're wrong, and there is something afterwards, which I believe there is, I'm just saying. Hope. That's all we have is hope. And I want to do a little exercise with you this morning, okay? And it's about hope. So what I want you to do, I want you to take a deep breath, and in just a minute, I want you to take a deep breath of air, and then we're going to let it out, and let it out, and let it out, and let it out as much as you can. Okay? You going to play with me? All right. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Let it out. Don't breathe. Let it out. Let it out. More. Don't pass out on me. More. More. Breathe. 
All we had was the hope that the air is there. <laughs> and it felt really good when you took that breath, didn't it? Some of you, I saw you getting a little... But it felt really good when you took that breath. But all we have is that breath is there. And you know, that air is there. And you know, we don't know that we need that air until we don't have that air. I want to tell you this morning, you need the hope that God has for you as a congregation. And that hope is not Mike Flint. And that hope is not Dwayne Carter. And that hope is not the deacons of this church or the leadership of this church. That hope only resides in Christ alone through faith alone. That's it. That's it. Christ alone through faith alone. We rejoice in the hope. Verse 3. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. What? Someone got a different translation? That can't be right. Rejoice in sufferings? Want to do that? Want to rejoice in sufferings? Anybody? That's unheard of! But it's biblical. It's biblical. Rejoice in sufferings. Why? It goes on, Paul lays it out. Knowing that your suffering produces endurance. Let me tell you what you're all going to have to have. Over the next 6, 8, 10, 12 months, whenever God decides to bring a new pastor in here, you're going to have to have endurance. You're going to have to have endurance to put up with whoever you, me or whoever you call to be your uh, interim pastor. You're going to have to have endurance to put up with Mike, and I know that's going to take a whole lot. <laughs> but you're going to have to have endurance to, to deal and do the things that your pastor always dealt with and did without your even thinking that... You know, you all thought he just came up here and sat in the little office area over there. You think he, you know, he went to the hospital for sick or he went around and visited the, some of the older people. Oh, heck no. He did a lot. What did he do? I don't know. I wasn't him. But now you all got to pick up the, the slack. I remember meeting with your deacons a couple weeks ago when Mike was in there and they were saying, well, well who's going to do this and who's going to do that? And I just... You remember my guy's kind of leaning back and said, You all are. <laughs> you all are. You're not calling me to be your pastor. I'm not going to come and do all of your counseling. I'm not going to come and do all of your visitation and all. I live in Jeff City. I'll come and help. But you all are. That's the endurance that's going to take to move forward. But you can't endure it on your own, you have to endure it in Christ. Through faith. Why will we do that? Because we know the endurance produces character. And, and knowing this community the way I do, there needs to be some more really godly character in this community, in this county, in Missouri. We really know so in the United States of America, North America, this hemisphere, the world, there needs to be godly character. I want to tell you, when I was a little kid, and Mike Smith would have me come to Bible school with him, and we would drink Church Lady Kool-Aid and eat fantastic cookies. When I was a young man, young boy, I never ever dreamed that I would be speaking the Word of God to you today. Heck, when I was a teenager, Driving up. By the way, how come kids don't cruise anymore? <laughs> I mean, Christian, what's up with that? How many tires did you wear out going around here? <laughs> he's my brother. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's not here to take up for himself. <laughs> I never dreamed that I would pick up a Bible and speak spiritual truth to you. It wasn't until I was 26 years old when God started prompting my heart. And it wasn't until I was older than that until God called me to salvation. And it wasn't until after that that God called me to, to, to speak the word. Character. I want to tell you one of the longest hour and a half or two hours I've ever spent in my life 
was over here in the room that you all turned into a nursery with about 29 million deacons staring down at me when I was licensed to preach. Hour and a half. Some of you were there. Some of you weren't very nice. <laughs> Endurance. Endurance builds character. And character produces hope. And the reason that we walk around as Christians today hopeless is because we do everything on our own and not through Christ. I want to share with you this morning, dear church, that God's love has been poured out into our hearts. Not my love. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit to radically redefine who we are. And I can only speak from self. But speaking from self, from, from young boy to teenage, to young adulthood, to middle age adulthood, to where I am today, God has radically redefined me. Daily now. Listen, daily now. God radically redefines who I am. But it's only by faith in Christ that that can happen. As a congregation, by faith in Christ there is tomorrow. By faith in Christ there is next week. By faith in Christ, there is next year. By faith in Christ, there are new leaders. Let's walk through this together. By faith in Christ, hand in hand, and allow God to moisten, to penetrate, to mold, and to work his way in this church producing character through endurance of faith, love, and hope. This morning, if you've never come to a point in your life where you've asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior, Lord and Savior, if you've never come to a point in your life where you know that without a shadow of a doubt, that if this was your last day on earth, you don't know what the future would hold. If you've ever been so freaked out that you don't know where to turn or how to think, chances are you need to ask Jesus to be Lord of your life. And when you ask Him and give Him permission to come into your life, because that's what He's waiting for, He can do this on His own, but He's asking for you to throw your arms open and say, Oh God, come, I need your help. That's turning your life over to Him. That's giving Him Lordship. And when you do that, salvation comes. <coughs> salvation comes. And with salvation is eternal life. And with eternal life is knowing that you know that you know that heaven is real. And eternity is forever. And it's yours as a free gift. Many of you know that. Some of you probably don't know that. Many of you have heard that. Some of you have never responded to that. It's pretty stinking frightening to walk down these aisles. Then they're done that. Pretty frightening to stand before a group of people. But it's the greatest thing that you will ever do is turn your life over to Jesus Christ. And allow Him to lead you. This morning, if that's you, in just a few moments, Carol's going to play something on the piano, and, and Mike's going to be down front. I'll, I'll, I'll step down here as well. If you need to talk to someone about salvation, please come. Some of you are in here today, and you have been wrapped up in self indulgence. Well, you're a Christian, you know you have hope but you have been wrapped up in self-worry and doubt and fear about what tomorrow's going to bring, I'm asking you this morning to release that to God. Because that's just Satan working in your life. Because Satan wants us to focus more on the darkness than he wants us to focus on the light. Release that 
whatever it is to God today. And do that publicly because it will make a difference. It will make a difference in your life. We talked about church membership and all that stuff on a later day. But this morning, if you need to make a commitment to God, please, please, do so. Let's pray with you, please. Father, today, as we come before you to do the things that you would have us to do, Lord, you know each of our hearts in a massive way. God, you know what we need. And Lord, you know what it's going to take to bring us there. So Father, I pray this morning that you would remove obstacles and, and remove barriers that keep us separated. Lord, we know that you have laid your cross across the valley. Father, give us what we need to walk that bridge that you have made. Father, this morning, we trust you in all things. But I take this time and make it amazing. In your name I pray. Amen. One thing before we go. <coughs> this altar is wide open. This is open for you to come and get it. <laughs> Maybe you don't need to make a public decision, but you need some God time. And I don't know why this wood is so amazing, but there's a difference being on your knees at an altar. I can't explain that. Come to the altar. It's there for you. Let's stand. Come. We have a decision this morning.